Hello, this is Opera Unbound, a podcast that breaks the barriers between opera singers and the audience. We will cover the process, challenges, stereotypes, and inspirations associated with opera. If you like the content that we're putting out and you'd love to see more, make sure you subscribe to our channel as well as share it with all your friends. Welcome back to another episode of Opera Unbound. Today, we are giving you a scoop of the funny, unfortunate, and sometimes quite embarrassing stories uh, that happen in performances. Uh, Mike and I are each going to tell some stories, and I don't know, you want to go first? Sure. Um, Well, first of all, let's back up. We had planned to record a different episode before doing this one, but then this thought came to me, like, why don't we just tell stories? You know, because we're so focused legitimately and for good reason on the accessibility of opera. We are talking about how it relates to a lot of people and making it fun and all that stuff. But there's just some things that that you just need to talk about that are just hilarious. And I almost feel like this is one of those things. I mean, it's not like we're super experienced, like 30 years in the business, but we've been around the block more than once. And uh, funny things happen. And who doesn't like telling you, you know, stories of their past. And so I felt like this would be a fun thing. So let's first talk about an embarrassing moment. Now, as I've mentioned before, um, I've done a lot of outreach tours uh, of opera to mostly elementary schoolers, which are a ton of fun and they're really valuable. And the very first one I ever did was with a company in Seattle and we were doing The Daughter of the Regiment. And my character was Hortensius, who is the Marquise's servant. And the Marquise in this show, while not a terrible person really, but she is the quote-unquote bad person in the show. And because it's condensed down to, I think ours was like 40 minutes or so, there's a lot of um, storyline that needs to be spliced together through dialogue and so the interlude between act one and act two even though we don't have an intermission but musically speaking for us there is this scene where i'm um switching the scenery around a little bit and also kind of filling in what what happened now when we were rehearsing this there was never enough dialogue to to do all of this and so what i decided to do about two or three days into the show is I started to make up stories about how when I wouldn't do what the Marquise wanted me to do, she would send me off as a punishment somewhere. And so at the time, Frozen, the first Frozen movie had just come out. And it was obviously all the rage at the time with the kids. And so I thought, okay, this will be perfect. I'll link it to Frozen. That'll keep them engaged. So there was this one performance... And basically the, the shtick would go, yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, the Marquise, when I do not do what she, uh, she tells me to do, you know, she does, she sends me off, which the reason why I'm speaking this way is he's French and it's a terrible French accent, but I think it's hilarious anyway. So it's like, she sends me off and you know what she did the last time she sent me to the Pole. Yeah, Zinopo. But you know who I met there? I met these two girls, Elsa and Anna. And they were like, Hortensius, let it go. And so they would laugh, and then we would move on with the thing. Okay, now at the end of each of these shows, we always had a Q&A, which is kind of a grab bag of questions when you're asking, you know, kindergartners through fifth graders about opera. And this one girl raises her hand, and she stands up, and she's very visibly annoyed and we don't know why and she puts her hand down as she stands up and she just goes <sighs> like i could hear her exhale from like 40 feet away it was that loud oh yes and she's like you know that frozen takes place in norway not the north pole right <laughs> and, and so of course i had to take that question because it's clearly directed at me and also she probably didn't listen to the rest of the show after that point because she was so annoyed by the fact that i mixed that up and uh i was like uh actually i did not know that um thank you for correcting me i will do more research next time i do stories that i make up for shows thank you (laughs) and 
<laughs> Everybody else was just like, oh my god. Like, really? Well, one, it's like, dude, why didn't you do the uh, the research? But also, oh man, he just totally ruined that girl's morning because he didn't have his shit together. Um, <laughs> and I was like, wow, I got, oh. And you now know that you're not smarter than a fifth grader. I am not smarter than a fifth grader. There is nothing more <laughs> humbling than being owned by someone a quarter of your age. It's, oh, man. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty terrifying. It's, it's brutal. Yeah, it, it was rough, but I made it through. So there's my embarrassing one for you. How about you, Rachel? Okay, so um, my embarrassing one, I think, is, is probably more cringy embarrassing than uh, what you experienced. <laughs> what was it? 2018, when we did the um, Opera Muse Carmen? Yeah, it was 2018. We did operas in people's backyards or living rooms through um, a group called Opera Muse. And we did a production of Carmen. And in this production, which Mike modernized, redoing some of the plot and, you know, like the the language. So it connected more easily to modern audiences um, Carmen was a stripper, so she's still outcast in society. And she gets the opportunity to um, be like the main event on like the the big night, Friday, Saturday, night, whatever. So yeah, in in this production, in the castanet scene, we do a strip dance scene. And, you know, this is normally fine, but um, my dad was visiting, so he was at the show and... Uh, <laughs> There were also children in the audience, which normally is not a big deal when you're on an opera stage. And, you know, you've got, like, at least 50 feet between you and the front the front row. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had more, like, <laughs> 10 feet between me and the front row. So um, I'm, like, you know, in, in before I go into the scene, I'm like, oh, man. So there's children here. Okay. Um, I need to tone down just a little bit. Not freak out any parents. Mm-hmm. Also, my father's here. Um, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna put that one in a different room and not think about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shove it down, shove it down. <laughs> you know, uh, made it through the scene. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know, want to run away and hide or anything. I think everybody took it well. The parents were like, okay, yeah. I mean, the kids were, the kids were like halfway paying attention anyways because they're kids. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, my dad didn't make any weird remarks, so that's good. I didn't feel awkward about that afterwards, but uh, that definitely goes down in uh, my more embarrassing sh- moments during shows. Yeah, that would definitely be very awkward. I really, I had moved out to New York by that point, and so I wasn't able to see that epic situation. I would have really reveled in that. Um, I will tell you, though, Julian... Julian did not um, make any changes to his <laughs> oh my his God. whole uh, thing. It was great. The, his Julian was our Escamillo um, Riesenthal. Julian Riesenthal, and uh, mm-hmm. he had a very very funny routine for doing the Toria Door song um, as a stripper. Oh yeah, and we also did beatboxing in that. That was really cool. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things. I mean, I love Julian. He's a great comedic performer but the fact that he's a rock star beatboxer and we're doing it in a strip club and while you're doing the castanet thing he's doing that whole beatbox thing it was so awesome it was perfect i mean i honestly was thankful that he was so good at beatboxing because like we ended up making like carmen beat not so great at the castanets so like the beatboxing took over because like let me tell you about doing those castanets while dancing and singing it's very complicated, and I feel like I need like five oh, years sure. of training just to be able to do it well. Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, I'm going to dovetail sort of on this. Uh, see, this this is less embarrassing, but it kind of dovetails into the story you just did. This is my funny moment. This is actually a multi-layered one. So for those of you who know much about my recital work, I used to do this um, – this recital called love in the time of Tinder. And the idea was, are we any better now? And I think I started doing it in 2017. Are we any better now at love in 2017 versus the 1600s? Or are we basically just as terrible, but we have apps and all that stuff, uh, to help make dating better or whatnot. So 
what I did is I would either do songs that are already in English or I would take other ones and translate them based on a situation and or a joke that I was going for. And so one of the arias I've always wanted to sing, but it's not my voice type. And I think it's pretty rare that a baritone or a bass baritone would do it even as a concert piece is Ombra Mai Fu, which is one of Handel's great melodies. And I I would set it up by saying, you know, one of the things that's that's very common it now are fetishes. So let's talk about them. You know, and so I said, you know, there's this fetish and that fetish. And I can't remember what it's called. But there are like some f- funny fetishes. Well, funny is a relative term. I find them comical. One of them, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like, you love having sex in front of mirrors. Hmm. I'm like, well, well, that's really interesting. I mean, I can actually kind of see how that would be good because you can make sure your form is good. <laughs> Nobody wants that bad form. No, no, right? no one wants bad form. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you're with the person, uh, if you really like them, they probably give you the special feelings. You want to see how they react instead of all the other sensory things that can happen. But then it would always end with, this one where it's you are turned on more when you are having sex against some kind of wood. You know, that could be the floor. It could be a wall. It could be your grandmother's uh, crucifix. Oh, my. Or it could be a tree. So in the beginning of Handel's Cerse, Cerse walks out and he sees a tree. And he sings this beautiful melody that says, I love this tree. It's my favorite tree. It's so beautiful. Now, based on the information I just gave you about fetishes, is it that interpretation or is it, that's my favorite tree. Mm, I love that tree. It's so beautiful. Throughout the course of the aria, I say, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you decide. I don't translate it, but I inflect it differently. The first half of it was pretty straight. And then the second half was as if it had a fetish for the tree. Now, when I would perform this, as many of you know, most pianos are made out of, you guessed it, wood. Oh, boy. So I would then start to literally caress and eventually hump the piano. Because Cersei's got a thing for wood that only a tree can provide. When I did this once in one of these, uh, you know, house concerts, there was literally a 13-year-old boy within arm's length of me humping this piano. And uh, I was like, I'm not going to turn this down. I'm, I'm just going to let the cards fall where they fall. And I afterwards, mean, his dad, who was with him. I feel like, you know. Yeah, that's, I guess that's a little different than. They've probably already been exposed to something oh yeah definitely especially with today's media and all that but uh the dad came up to me afterwards and he's like yeah i was just watching my kid the whole time just seeing his eyes just you know go wide (laughs) and his mouth drop (laughs) as you're doing your thing um but so there was that but actually i also received the best backhanded compliment i've ever received After I talked to him, maybe five minutes later, I ended up talking to this older uh, woman. She was probably mid-60s. She comes up to me and she's like, you know, I really, really enjoyed the handle. I was like, oh, thank you. And she's like, yeah, you know, it's such a beautiful melody. And now that I've seen it live for the first time, I want to go learn more about the show and hear other people do it. And so in my head, I'm like, that's great. This is the whole point of me doing these things. They're going to go research it. They're going to get more hooked to it. Boom, I've done my job. But then she says, and I want to do this mostly because I want to get the picture of you humping a piano out of my (laughs) head and actually have the real interpretation now in my brain. I was like, okay, that's fair. Yeah, definitely go research that. It, it, it'll be uh, worth your while. Handle's great. And then she left. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that could be like a, a really good uh, alternative way to get people more involved in opera. Yeah, well, that's why I do it. That's why I do all the crazy and stupid, quote unquote, things I do. Because uh, you got to get people somehow. Sometimes it's being it's making a complete ass of yourself. Yeah. If it's done correctly, yeah. um, it can be really effective. So... Absolutely. I kind of have like two funny stories and neither is super long. So I might just tell both. 
So the first one, I actually was not on the stage, but behind the stage. Um, this was during a production of Matter Butterfly. I was Kate Pinkerton, but I still had to sing in the, sim- the humming chorus. And I also, uh, for some reason, was put in charge of doing the pitch pipe. I guess they thought I was uh, responsible. <laughs> uh, we see where this is going. <laughs> so if anybody has ever used a pitch pipe, they know that like you have to do the angle and the breath pressure kind of just right to get it to cooperate. And I don't know. We did like 13 runs of the show. Maybe it was only 12. 12 or 13. I don't know. It was a lot. I think halfway through the run, you know, like every night the pitch pipe was fine. No issues. And then one night I like go to blow and nothing happens. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, like slight panic happens. Oh, people got to get their pitch right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I just give it a little bit more pressure and it goes. <laughs> 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 it turns into a duck call. Kind of, yeah. I'm like, I get this glare from the conductor, and I'm like, oh, bro, it's not me. Pitch pipe. And, like, you know, of course, like, half the people backstage now are, like, trying not to giggle as they're trying to do the humming chorus. Mm-hmm. Oh, my and, goodness. And, you know, so then it, like, became the, the, like, running joke every time. So, like, now every time we're backstage about to do the humming chorus, you hear people giggling and having to collect themselves. Luckily, mm-hmm. it only happened once. But it was, I mean, it was pretty funny, honestly. Like, things happen. You can oh, be yeah. mad about them, or you can just be like, yeah, that that was that was funny. I actually, I didn't mention this when we talked beforehand, but I have a similar story. Mm-hmm. So I was in uh, college uh, in my master's. I was one of the TAs, and I was the assistant choir director of the, the top choir. We were doing this alumni mm-hmm. event. And I went to the University of Idaho and there was like this set of three or four songs. We did it every single one. Uh, It was like the alma mater and then these two or three uh, very Idaho songs. And uh, because I was the grad student, I was in charge of the pitch pipe Mm -hmm. and I didn't realize what piece we were doing. And so I blew the pitch for a different piece and it was a fourth low. And so it just totally threw everything off. Now, Thankfully for us, we had a legit bass in our um, in our uh, choir, Mm -hmm. you know, because normally the the song goes down to an F and it just kind of hangs out down there. This now it's at a C and he's just like, like belting it out. But it it was just like a cacophony of chaos and of pitch. And our director didn't want to just leave it sounding like shit. Mm -hmm. So. He gave us the, like, go to the top again sign. And we did it, like, the same verse, like, two or three times until it finally got to the right key. And then we went on to the other verses. Needless to say, I didn't do the pitch pipe ever again after that. (laughs) You know what? At least I got to keep my job. Yeah. I lost it. (laughs) So. Uh, The other kind of funny story I was going to tell, this one's pretty quick. So my actual like first leading role was um, Mrs. Lovett in Sweeney Todd um, Mm -hmm. when I was at university at the University of North Texas. And um, in our production, we had a trap door in the middle of the stage that had a large metal loop as the like door handle latch thing. And um, it Mm -hmm. didn't get put down when they when they had opened it and closed it, they didn't make sure that the latch had fallen. And I was doing Worst Pies in London, and I was walking over to um, the Sweeney that was in my cast, and I almost face planted um, <laughs> <laughs> over over the ring, um, which in itself, uh, yeah, probably really funny to people watching. But I honestly, the part that's funnier to me is like how calmly the Sweeney. Um, in my cast, just he's like really tall guys, like over six foot tall. Just reaches his foot out, and just, you just hear tunk. <laughs> so he knocks it down, so that you know <laughs> I don't actually face plant or somebody else doesn't throughout the course of the show. Yeah, totally. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was it was definitely like a oh shit moment. It was all it was going through. Oh shit! Oh shit! Oh yeah. Shit. Um, <laughs> okay. I guess now for the unfortunate stories. Yes. It's a little bit unfortunate it's, uh, that uh, sometimes we do need to bleed for our art. Yeah, that's right. I said if we got to bleed, we got to shed the blood. One of the, I would say, hmm, I would actually say the most impactful 
piece I ever did other than the ones that I wrote, because that's that's kind of unfair because, you know, it has a special place when you write it. Right. But um, outside of that, I would say the most fun, but also the, the most impactful show I've ever done was with Seattle Opera's Outreach Program. And the show was Cinderella in España. It was a modern version of Cinderella. And I was the prince. And at the beginning of the show, um, the prince is basically a man child who eventually comes to by the end. But in the beginning, he's just gotten uh, home from a night of partying and he's just kind of messing around and he falls asleep in a chair. His dad comes out with his servant or whatever and they're like, hey, let's wake him up. And so I'm sitting in this chair. The king comes over and he just yells like, bah, or whatever. And it wakes me up. And of course, I fall out of the chair. Okay, well... I would do this at least twice a day because we had two shows a day Mm -hmm. and I was performing it probably two or three times a week. And for whatever reason, I kept hitting my elbow when I fell out of the chair in the same place pretty much every single time. I that's towards the beginning of that scene. The scene's probably like four or five minutes long. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I go off stage and I'm going to change from my... um, you know, short sleeve shirt and shorts and do a suit for the rest of the show. And I'm about to do that. And one of my castmates is back there and she's like, you're bleeding. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And I looked down and my arm is completely covered in blood. Like it looked like something from a movie like that bad. Like I got I'm shot. I'm honestly surprised there, there wasn't a kid that like didn't interrupt the show. Oh, I know. Yeah, exactly. And or uh, my castmates, they didn't look at my arm at all to be like, you know, give me like a head thing like, hey, look at your arm yeah. kind of thing. Because you have that like ESB thing uh-huh. with your castmates sure. sometimes. Sure. I look down and yeah, it's just blood everywhere. So she uh, in this version, she's a waitress instead of, you know, helping her sisters with their stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she actually took a bunch of the props and wrapped my arm Um <laughs> And then I put my suit coat on and, and the long sleeve shirt. And one would think that would be the end of it. Eventually you put a, a band aid on and it's fine. No, it took me like a month of falling and eventually getting to a point where I didn't bleed. It was, uh, cause it just kept reopening and reopening. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I can literally say I've shed blood for, uh, for a show. I, I guess I'm pretty, I'm in pretty deep. Uh, when it comes to my love for the art form, yeah. I'm really willing to sacrifice my body. Uh, Got that whole blood, so. sweat, and tears thing going. Yeah, it's it's literal. Yep. Uh, I I don't think I've bled for the arts on on stage. Um, so are you like even serious about this then? Like really? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead serious. Dead serious. Ah, oh, there you go. Yeah. All right, I'll I'll let you go now. <laughs> so um, I'm pretty. I have pretty bad eyesight. I can't, you know, legally drive without glasses. And um, honestly, I, I it's funny. Like when I was in middle school, I I went through that whole phase, like that I refused to wear glasses because I wanted contacts. I'm really cognizant of that, and I I when I have to do a show, I'm like, okay, I got my contacts in, like ready to go on stage, because like you definitely don't want to be a safety hazard to yourself or your colleagues on mm-hmm. stage if you have bad eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have made it all the way to the theater on a couple of occasions without my contacts. And usually you don't have time to go back home. Fortunately, mm-hmm. nothing serious has ever happened. It's just like people have to lead me around backstage because it's just dark enough that I can't see things. And this one time we were doing this show um, with a storm scene. It was the Pearl Fishers and there's a storm scene in it. So like people were usually like running all all around stage and it's pretty complicated music. So it's nice to be able to look at the conductor for cues and things, Um, which I did not get the opportunity to do uh, uh, during one of the performances for this show. (laughs) It was because you were blind. I was blind. Yeah, I was like, well, hopefully I don't fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> like I swear, Maestro, I am looking at your stick. I just can't see there's it. Just, that's why I'm there's off. There's just three of them. 
Yeah, there's three of them. How do how am I supposed to know which one to look at? They all look the same. Yeah, we survived. Everyone survived, and yeah, I did. I did have somebody lead me around backstage just so I didn't fall on my face. <laughs> That's funny. I, I mean, I can honestly, thankfully, say that I've never had anything horrendous happen on stage. Never had like a serious wardrobe malfunction, which I, I do know has happened to people. I've definitely tripped over whenever you have like really long skirts with trains. Like everybody trips on those. It, it just happens. Yeah. yeah. But never, never anything serious and no major injuries. I don't know. Were you in the production of Trovatore at Seattle Opera? No, I wasn't. Oh, man. So, like, just quickly, I'll tell this one, too. During the production, there was a cross that the Duke would, like, knock over. Well, one time, um, it was Michael Mays. He just did it with a little bit more gusto. And uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it actually <laughs> fell into the pit. Oh! <laughs> yeah. Um, luck- luckily, no one was hurt. The conductor did stop the show for just a few seconds and said, okay, you know, everybody's fine. No one's hurt. We're going to keep going. (laughs) 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 But yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely a a frightening moment at least. And very fortunate that no one was hurt. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, uh, speaking of potentially frightening, when we were doing Comptori, there's the big scene with Rambo and he's telling his old story about where he went. It's a men's chorus scene with the main principles of the show. And there's this moment where Rambo basically goes from, he does a big circle around the stage and everybody's following him. And when we start the scene, we as the chorus members were bringing out basically props and set pieces. And this is why you don't give that responsibility to singers (laughs) or you're very particular who you give it to. Because we didn't set up the table correctly, apparently. So when they do the big circle and Rambo comes around, one of our uh, colleagues is supposed to jump onto the table like he's sliding into home base, like head first. And because it wasn't set up properly, this whole thing falls to the ground. So we got fake fruit flying everywhere. Oh, man. We have fake milk, which is actually water with white food coloring, which was really cool, actually, now that I think about it, because you could see it in the glasses. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it's just going everywhere. And we're, of course, like trying to sing, because it's a pretty active scene, while also making sure that nobody's injured. And thankfully, no one was. But I bet the audience was like, wait, was was that supposed to happen? It's hilarious. But like... Uh, I don't know about that. So, yeah, thankfully nobody was hurt, and it only happened once. Oh, live theater. Crazy things happen on stage Totally. I mean, even just stuff that... uh, I think my favorite thing to watch is when performers, you know a piece well enough, or you just know how performers are. You know that they're screwing up, They and they are trying to get their way out of it. Yeah, I mean, sometimes... Sometimes that's the best part of being a performer, too, though, is, like, the recovery from a mishap. Oh, totally. Yeah. Especially, I think it's harder in opera and musical theater because, well, especially opera, because if you screw up dialogue, it's a lot easier for your Mm -hmm. colleague to just kind of jump in and maybe lead you back on. You can't do that in opera. Like, you have to make it work with the rhythm and... And all this mm-hmm. stuff, and <laughs> sometimes it it really just doesn't work uh, unless you're real crafty in the moment. Well, that I mean, that's really all the stories I have. I don't know if you have any others you want to share. Uh, you know, I I think that's good for now. Um, we can always do another one of these later, uh, or we could do a, a a solo thing. So I think I'll I'll stop there. I have some uh, rather colorful stories that maybe I'll I'll tell another time. So. Sounds good. I hope you enjoyed our show today. And, you know, it really helps us to spread the love of opera and breaking down those barriers. If you like, share, subscribe, get your grandmother, your grandchildren, your children, your children's children, yeah, their oh, friends. Their friends. <laughs> They're like teachers, third cousin, <laughs> 15th removed. Just get them all in there. Yeah, if you enjoy our show, just, just share it. That's all we ask. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. For more information about the podcast or for extras, check out our Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash opera unbound. Ciao.